All Inclusive, a podcast on inclusion, innovation, and social justice with Jay Ruderman. Hi, I'm Jay Ruderman, and this is All Inclusive, a podcast focused on inclusion, innovation, and social justice. Since 1937, almost 2,000 people have tried to take their own life by jumping from the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. On September 24, 2000, one of those attempts was a 19-year-old Kevin Hines. A couple years prior, Kevin had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and was dealing with serious psychosis at the time of his suicide attempt. He could not stop listening to voices inside his head that told him to take his own life. Miraculously, he survived the 220-foot jump thanks to a series of contributing factors which included a sea lion keeping him afloat until the Coast Guard arrived. Kevin is now a mental health activist and best-selling author who travels the world telling his story of hope, healing, and recovery. Kevin, welcome to All Inclusive. Thank you for having me, Jay. Glad to be here. So let's start on the day that you thought was going to be the end of your life. Um, Tell me about your thoughts on the morning of September 24, 2000, right before you took the bus to go to the Golden Gate Bridge. Well, uh, that morning, I believed I was useless. I felt I had no value, and I thought I had to die. I thought that suicide was my only answer. I was wrong, but I couldn't see it. And it led me to a devastating place. I was in what's what I termed to be lethal emotional pain. And that pain was so overwhelming, I wanted that pain to end. I always ask people, what is it that you want to happen when you find yourself in excruciating physical pain? What do you want that pain to do? And the overwhelming answer is stop, go away, or end. And that's the same for brain pain. And that's what led me to the Golden Gate Bridge in an attempt to take my life. I was living with severe bipolar disorder, and I thought that 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 was my only option. And I I, I wish I knew back then what I know today that that was wrong. So just for those listeners who may not know what bipolar disorder is, can you just give us a few words of, of what it is and how it affected you? Sure. Or how it does continue to affect you? Absolutely. And it does. Uh, So think of skyrocketing manic euphoric natural highs. And then once you go up, you must come down. So coming crashing down into this dark abyss of depression and pain. That was that it was and sometimes is the norm for me. Uh, You know, bipolar disorder is a mood disorder, uh, a, a brain imbalance where you're you have manic highs and depressive lows, but when you have psychotic features with bipolar disorder, like me or type one, um, you also have hallucinations, auditory and visual, panic attacks, uh, and paranoid delusions. And so I was dealing with all of this simultaneously before I went to the Golden Gate Bridge to take to try to take my life, and it was just completely uh, mind numbing, uh, and and it, it all 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 combined led me to the GGB to try to take my life. So um, tell me about the bus ride over there. You, you, you deliberately got on a bus. You wrote a suicide note to, to your family and loved ones. Um, tell me about the ride and what you were thinking at the time. You know, it was on that bus that I became what suicidologists, people that study suicide prevention call ambivalent. I desperately wanted to live, but I believed I had to die. And those are two categorically different things. And on that bus ride, I said to myself in my head, if one person says, hey, kid, are you okay? Brother, is something wrong? Or pal, can I help you? Or a variation of the three, I would have told them everything and begged them to save me. But instead on that bus, as I cried profusely to myself, as I yelled aloud on a crowded bus filled with people about my inner pain, the only person to react aloud to me was a man to my left who said to the fellow next to him, what the hell's wrong with that kid with a smile on his face? Complete apathy. And this is actually very common. 
this if then scenario with suicidal ideation or suicide attempts. If one person says or does this, I will. If one person says or does this, I won't die today. Um, and my, my reaction was, was that if one person says, are you okay? I would have told them everything and pleaded with them to save me. So I know we're going to talk about, um, the details of, of, of what happened in your attempted suicide. And, um, let's just maybe stop for a second, because I know that this can be triggering for people that are listening who may be thinking about suicide. Um, what would you say to them regarding, um, where they are right now and, and, and what they can do to get help. I would say that whatever you're going through right now, whatever you're dealing with, and if you have suicidal ideations, stop, take a breath, take another breath, pause for a moment and recognize that we're all going to pass away someday. None of us are immortal. Give yourself time plus hard work for things to change. I have now lived 20 years past my suicide attempt, never again attempting to take my life by, by working around some tools and techniques for better brain, mind, behavioral, mental health, and physical health and well being. If you work hard with your mental health, you can survive mental pain. And suicide never has to be the solution to your problem because it is the problem. And so if you recognize that, and you find yourself to be self-aware with your struggle, you can always survive that, that struggle. It's a matter of perspective and perception. And so I work really hard with educating myself as to my diagnosis, exercising every day, eating healthy foods, uh, using coping strategies, using various forms of therapy and treatment, reputable proven forms of therapy and treatment, I put together a 10-step plan of better brain health, better brain well-being, and I do it every day, and it keeps me here. I live with regular thoughts of suicide, yet I've never again attempted to take my life because of these techniques. And it's something that are science-backed, evidence-informed, proven tools for better brain health. And I really built it myself, uh, for myself, and then I shared it with the world. Um, you can find my plan on youtube.com slash Kevin Hines under a, a video called the art of wellness 2.0. And it, it can help you stabilize your, 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 your wellness. And it's helping thousands of people around the world from as far as Peru, Africa, China, Japan, all across Europe, uh, and Canada. I want it to help people on, on your show, Jay, uh, because it, it, it's something that we can all strive for if we're struggling we can defeat that struggle one day at a time. It, you don't have to. You don't have to think about the future. You don't have to dwell on the past. You have to focus on right here, right now, and then being here tomorrow. So I, I think one thing I grew up with the term of um, someone committed suicide, but I think it's accepted now to say someone died by suicide. Um, that that suicide is not something that you're intentionally making a decision to do that it that it that it's sort of controlling you yeah. um it's that, just, it, it compels you. you you're compelled to take your life by voices in your head or or mental struggle or trauma and you know the reality is uh saying committed is like someone's committing a crime or adultery or something it's just it's just an old hat way of saying it died by suicide just like someone would die of any other organ diseased um, is the, is the right way to say it. And language does matter. It does matter. Uh, and, and so we say die by suicide now, uh, because it's just a, it's a, it's a way to respect, uh, the person that passed and the people that, uh, have thought of attempting, uh, and let them know that they're not alone, that their survivorship matters and that they matter. So if someone desperately needs help and, and they're listening to this, there is a national suicide hotline. Uh, the number is uh, 1-800-273-8255. Um, they can always reach out to the national suicide hotline. I understand from you, there's a another method that, that may be um, quicker that people can also reach out to if they're in a place where they're uh, thinking about suicide. 
Yes, you can text right now CNQR to 741741. And that CNQR stands for something. It stands for Courage to Talk About Your Mental Health. N stands for Normalize the Conversation of It. Q stands for Ask the Questions. Are you thinking of killing yourself? Have you made plans to take your life? And do you have the means? Because that doesn't put the thought in someone's mind. It gives them permission to speak on their pain and a pain shared as a pain halved. And R stands for recovery, living proof. And so CNQR to 741741, the crisis text line, someone will be with you in seconds um, and you will get the help you need to stay here. Uh, We've had active rescues from all around the country. uh, And that conquer keyword uh, is something we came up with uh, as part of our conquer collective. So uh, let, let's get into um, September 24th. Um, you talked about <clears throat> taking the bus ride and crying profusely and, and no one really paying attention. And, and, and just as, as a human being living in our society in, in today's age, I think people are just in their own worlds and, and they're not really attuned to those around them, uh, especially people that need help. They're sort of... Um, avoiding those types of conversations, which is, which is unfortunate, but that's something that you experienced. And that was something you were looking for. I even remember, um, an article where you talked about getting to the golden gate bridge, um, and looking for people and walking up and down and, and, and looking for people to, to stop you. And even a woman who asked to take pictures, um, which you thought was a little bit bizarre, but, I guess you got to the point where no one really stopped and, and asked, are you okay? Yeah. Besides on that bus, being on the walkway of the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, a woman asked me to take her picture with her camera several times. I did, and she walked away. And it was at that moment I thought nobody cared. And you see, that was the furthest thing from the truth, Jay. Everybody cared. I remember my family, every one of my friends, my acquaintances would have been there to tear me from that rail to safety because of how much they cared. My brain wasn't allowing me to care. My brain was trying to kill me as I desperately tried to cling to life. And and like you said earlier, it wasn't a decision. It wasn't like I decided to go take my life like I would decide to have this cup of tea. Uh, It was a compulsion. I felt I had to die. And that feeling is so overwhelming when it happens. So it's so backbreaking. Uh, no pun intended, because I, I did break my back off the Golden Gate Bridge, but it was it was it was terrible. I just wish I wish I had the ability that day to tell my father that morning what I was truly feeling. The one thing that's come out of this, Jay, that's been positive, is that today, when I become suicidal, the first thing I do is tell anyone around me what's going on, so that they can help keep me safe. And it's usually my wife, usually my wife now. Uh, sometimes it's uh, my father or my friends, uh, but usually my wife. Um, and we we assess: is this an acute suicidal ideation? Is this something I need to go to the hospital for, or is this something where I just need to talk my way out of it until I feel better? And usually it's the latter right now, uh, and I get to a safe place. So you're on you're on the Golden Gate Bridge. Your hands are on the rail. You vault yourself over the rail. What were your thoughts in that second millisecond as soon as your hands left the rail? In that millisecond, my thoughts were these. What have I just done? I don't want to die. God, please save me. I had an instantaneous regret for my action and this 100% recognition I just made the greatest mistake of my life and it was too late. And as I fell, I thought, this is it. This is where I go. I hit the water. I shattered my T12, L1, L2 lower vertebrae into shards like glass. I missed severing my spinal cord by two millimeters. I went down 70 feet beneath the water surface. I opened my eyes. I swam toward the surface. I got closer and closer to the lit circle of water above me, and I thought, I'm not going to make it. And this is where I go. And that's when uh, 
I said to myself, Kevin, you can't die here. If you die here, no one will ever know you didn't want to. No one will ever know you knew you made a mistake. I broke the surface of the water, bobbed up and down in it, and I prayed, God, please save me. I don't want to die. I made a mistake on repeat. And he heard me. Uh, that, that, at that moment, something began to circle beneath me. Something large and very slimy and very, very alive. I thought, you've got to be kidding me. I didn't die jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge and a shark is going to eat me. But it turned out it was no shark. It was, in fact, a sea lion. And it was keeping me afloat until the Coast Guard boat arrived behind me. The Coast Guard boat arrives. The sea lion takes off. These officers pull me onto a flat board, put me in a neck brace, and start asking questions. And that's how my life was physically saved from the waters. Uh, and then in the hospital, one of the foremost back surgeons on the West Coast, who wasn't supposed to be there that day, happened to stay to do my surgery, the first and only of its particular kind. He invented it for me, saving me the ability to stand, walk, and run. Of the 39 Golden Gate Bridge jump survivors, and there's only 39 in the last 85 years of that bridge being opened, whereas nearly 3,000 or higher people have died there, the highest point for suicide in the world. Of the 39 that have survived, only five of us get to stand, walk, and run. They call us the most exclusive survivors club in the world. There's a book of the same name about our story. So when I say I get to be here, I really do. And what is it about the Golden Gate Bridge that, I mean, so many thousands of people have taken their lives there. You know, is it is it the height? Is it the accessibility? Is it, uh, you know, I mean, w- why did you choose that location? People choose the Golden Gate Bridge because of an ease of access to lethal means. It's a four-foot rail. It's simple. If you're tall enough, you can fall over. It's not because it's a beautiful view. It's not because it's a fantastic bridge. It's because it's easy. And one of the things we're doing right now that we fought for for the last 20 years is raising a net at the Golden Gate Bridge. My father founded the Bridge Rail Foundation in 2006 after the film The Bridge came out by Eric Steele. Uh, And we have legislatively fought for the nets to be put in place. And right now they're being constructed. And as of 2023, when the nets are finished, not one more beautiful soul will ever again die off the Golden Gate Bridge. And it will then become the largest and brightest beacon for suicide prevention all around the world. That's beautiful. And thank you for your role in that. You know, your story is really miraculous. There, there are so many things that happen from you not hitting the, the water head on um, to be able to come to the surface to a sea lion, um, you know, floating beneath you. And I know there's been many stories of, of sea mammals, um, you know, helping humans in distress. Um, but as I understand, you didn't understand it was a sea lion at that time. It was only later that, you know, you found out that it was a sea lion because someone had taken a picture. Yeah, someone – so so I, I, I truly thought it was a shark, and I was, I was literally punching it, but it wouldn't go away. And it's just bumping me up, and no longer am I wading in the water. I'm lying atop it being kept buoyant by this creature, having it circle around underneath me. And uh, – I, I, would, I was on a television program a year later promoting a suicide prevention campaign in San Francisco. And a man named Morgan wrote into the show and said, Kevin, I'm so very glad you're alive. I was standing less than two feet away from you when you jumped. It's haunted me until today. By the way, there was no shark like you mentioned on the show, but there was a sea lion. And the people above looking down believed it to be keeping your body afloat until the Coast Guard boat arrived behind you. Do you remember what, what when you were picked up by the Coast Guard, which I think was also a miracle because a woman immediately called the Coast Guard yes. when you were in the water. Yes, a woman, um, a, woman called, a, a woman who saw me go over the rail at the moment of my attempt had a car phone, not a cell phone, a car phone, and called her friend in the Coast Guard. Uh, and the reason the Coast Guard got to my position within less than the time I would set an hypothermia and drown was because of that woman's phone call. And do you remember what that Coast Guard officer said to you? Yes. Uh, there were several officers on the boat that pulled me out of the water. And one of them said, kid, do you know what you just did? And I said, yeah, I just took off the Golden Gate Bridge. I was fully conscious and aware. And they said, why? And I had no reasonable answer. I said, I don't know. I thought I had to die today. 
And the officer leaned in and said, son, do you understand how many people we pull out of these waters that are already dead? And I said, no, and I don't want to know. He said, I'm going to tell you anyway. He said, young man, this unit alone has pulled out 26 dead bodies from these waters. And one live one, you. And that gave me a great deal of perspective. Do you consider yourself a religious person, Kevin? I am a religious person. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Catholic. I've been a Catholic my whole life. The only time I lost my faith in God was when I left off that bridge. Uh, but I always say, no pun intended, I found him on the way down. Right. Right. And and you, you must see everything that happened to you and your survival and, and, and becoming a spokesman for um, suicide prevention to have some sort of divine intervention in your life. You know, personally, I feel like I feel like I do have that, and that's that's my prerogative. I've always felt that way. I don't push down anybody. You know, there's people that don't believe. That's fine, but this is this is something that you know all the things came into play to save my life. It wasn't just one sequence. It was, it was the woman's phone call. It was the sea lion. It was the coast guard. It was the doctor at the hospital staying for as long as he did, and and doing my surgery. You know, uh, had all had all those miracles not occurred. Um, my life would be a lot different uh, or, or I wouldn't exist. Can you tell me what it was like seeing your dad? I mean, he was the first person to show up at the hospital from your family and, and what that was like. It was so rough because my father is arguably the man that loves me the most in the entire world. And he was devastated. And this is a man who... In 19 years of knowing him up until that point, I was 19 when I jumped. I'd never seen the man cry, not a teardrop from his eye, not a, not a, not a, not a hard time in his, not a, not a, not a, not a visible struggle from his, from his face. Uh, you know, tough sunset Irishman. He and Debbie Hines adopted me and maybe their son. You know, uh, he was just the toughest SOB I ever knew. Like the drill sergeant who was never in the military, that kind of guy, you know. And he walks into my room and I remember looking up at him in my bracing structure that was keeping me together. And he looked down at me and he goes, Kevin, I'm sorry. I said, no, dad, I'm sorry. And waterfalls just poured from his eyes. I uh, just poured from his eyes. And uh, that was really difficult for both of us because he wasn't one to ever show emotion. You know, Kevin, many of us, I have I have four teenagers, and we worry about them every single day. And, you know, with social media and, and what's out there on the internet and so much time, you know, alone on their on their phones, um, I worry about my kids all the time. And, and, you know, I'm sure there are many listeners who have relatives and they're like, yeah, I'm just, I'm worried. And, and what do you do? Like, what, what are the steps we need to take to make sure? I mean, because like if a child of mine doesn't feel well, has a stomach ache, breaks a bone or whatever, I'm going to take them to the hospital. Um, there's so much stigma about, uh, around the issue of mental health. What do you do? You, you, you think like someone's just not right. I mean, what's your advice? Yeah. So, so for parents all around the, the world, you need to, you need to ask the questions. You need to be the type of parent that digs deep and asks the hard questions. You need to start off with, hey guys, you know, let's all have a conversation at the dinner table and let's be honest about what we're going through. Have you guys, first of all, have you guys dealt with any students at your school or at, at, in, your, in your experience that have had suicidal ideation? Have you, have you ever had thoughts of killing yourself yourselves? Have you ever made plans to take your life? Do you have the means? You know, Ask those direct questions. They don't put the thought in someone's mind. They give them permission to speak on their pain. And as I said before, a pain shared is a pain halved. Uh, the, the, the fact is that more people give truthful answers to the question, are you thinking of killing yourself, than the question, are you thinking of suicide, because of the taboo on the word suicide. The crisis text line algorithm has determined that. It's fascinating. That language really does matter, just like when we say died by suicide versus commit. And, you know, uh, the reality is if you're willing as a parent to have that open-ended conversation, but without um, with a lack of judgment afterwards, whatever the answer may be, and with a lack of anger afterwards, whatever the answer may be, 
and an understanding and an empathetic tone and kind eyes and saying, look, we care about you so much. We love you so much unconditionally. So, and we want to make sure you're safe every day. And so many people around the world are, are, are taking their lives, you know, more, more young African-American children ages five and up are taking their lives than ever before in this country. It's terrifying. So we need to, we need to be able to ask our kids, no matter what age they are, about these questions so they're aware of it. We, you know, I was just in Massachusetts with my godchildren, and one of them, uh, who's 10, um, has a student in his class who's currently suicidal, and he doesn't know what to do. Uh, and so we talked about that, and, and we had an open conversation. And one of them uh, is six, and we had a conversation with her um, about, about what this means. And, and you know what? It was terrifying to know that she understood what we were saying. So they're capable. They're they're in, they're intelligent. They are aware. We have to have the conversation. Well, I, I would say that that you know one of the things that that people talk about, and I'm I'm very interested in your journey of mental health recovery. Um, but it's often said that 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 people that are considering suicide that you never know, and and you know from what I have read and understood about you that you grew up in a loving family and did they have any inclination that this was going through your head that that this was this was a thought process that you were you were going through no uh, but 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 to be fair uh they didn't know because i hid it from them uh but but that all the more reason parents need to ask the questions nobody taught pat and debbie hines suicide prevention techniques no one taught Pat and Debbie Hines to ask the questions at a young age. No one taught Pat and Debbie Hines about mental health and well-being. So how could they know what to ask? I was in treatment. I was seeing a psychiatrist. I was on medications. They didn't know the medications were toxifying in my system, making me worse because I was on too many meds at one time, uh, which is not indicative of psychiatry or the field of medicine. Psychiatry in the field of medicine has helped save my life for 20 years. But this particular regimen of pills was affecting me in a negative way. Uh, we didn't learn that out till later, of course, after my attempt. Uh, but now we have the education. Now more people than ever before are talking about mental health. You know, now it's, I mean, look, look at it. It's even on the Olympic stage. You know, you, you've got Olympic athletes and even tennis players uh, talking about their mental health. Michael Phelps talking about his mental health. Um, and we need to respect people who take a step back uh, to take care of their mental health and well-being uh, because of their personal mental health struggles. Um, and, and I think that there's a lot of, you know, we, we call it stigma when someone is, is, is against those with mental health crises. But the reality is we don't call bigotry and hatred and prejudice stigma. We call it bigotry and hatred and prejudice. Let's call what's going on to those with mental illness exactly what it is. Marginalization and discrimination against them because of their brain pain. Uh, and, and let's let's help them be vocal about their struggle and understand what they're going through and empathize and lack in any judgment for them. So maybe you can get a little bit about your mental health process and, and how you went from being, you know, the aftermath of being, you know, the Golden Gate Bridge to recovering um, or being able to deal with on a day to day basis your mental health. Absolutely. And, and, and the, the reality is, is that I live in recovery every single day. So it's, it, it really is a process. Um, it's something that uh, I'm working on on a regular basis. Uh, and, and it's not something that comes necessarily easy. It's something that I, I, it's something that I fight for. Um, and so this, this is, I want to tell you about my 10 step routine to better brain health. Um, and it's something I put together years ago and it includes therapy and that's psychotherapy or talk therapy or teletherapy, music therapy, art therapy, blue wave light box technology therapy and breathing therapy, resonance breathing therapy, inhaling through my nose four seconds, holding for four seconds and releasing eight seconds like pursed lips, like a whistle, but no sound. And doing that 30 times in the morning, 30 times in the afternoon, 30 times at night, or whenever I'm having a panic attack, anxiety attack, or stress issue. And then uh, the next step is proper nutrition. And that's eating non-inflammatory foods more often than inflammatory foods. Foods that are filled with proper nutrients and minerals that you need to feed your brain. Uh, and, 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 and 
your gut to brain health is very important. So feeding your gut good, healthy foods, because your gut chemistry is directly connected to your brain chemistry, is really important. Um, uh, it's a symbiotic relationship, and one can't survive without the other. And if you're eating poorly, you're going to be damaging the functionality of your brain. Um, going forward from there uh, is exercise. I exercise three days a week. I'm going to be upping that to five or six days a week pretty soon uh, and getting back in the, the fighting shape I was uh, a few years ago. Exercise is a very helpful tool for my better brain health. If you're physically capable, get down to the ground and get to work because it can benefit you immensely. 23 minutes of rigorous exercise leads to 12 hours of better mood. Sleep is really important. If you have the ability to get seven, eight hours of sleep a night, um, I sleep that much and I, I, I sleep well. Um, my sleep functionality is really important. If I'm doing that, I'm, uh, I'm stabilizing my brain health in a great way. Uh, and these are just a few of the things I do to stabilize. Education, this one's a, a, a really important one. It's a two-parter. Educating myself as to my diagnosis and then educating my family and friends as to my struggles so that they understand me and can get my back instead of uh, wondering what's wrong with me or having me snap out of it or get over to move on or pull myself up by my, my bootstraps. They understand that this is a very real diagnosis. This is very legitimate and I need to get treatment for it so I can be better. Um, then I take medication every day with 100% accuracy. Uh, that's very helpful. I meditate. Uh, don't need to go into the details there, but meditation uh, is an active training of the mind that increases awareness and different meditation programs obviously approach that in different ways. You know, this, this reduces the activity in the brain's me center, um, and it really is something that can help you balance out your life. Um, and, then I, and then I advocate. I advocate for myself and my mental well-being with my doctors. Uh, and, I, and, 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 I, and I do public policy advocacy as well, so two types of advocacy there. And then I have coping strategies and mechanisms uh, like grounding techniques, socializing with family and friends, spending time with a pet, uh, like an emotional support animal, which I used to have, uh, time with myself, alone time, uh, using humor to deflect the pain, um, finding spirituality and faith uh, that helps me uh, stay stable. Uh, all these things are, are things I can do to, to stabilize. And then what I did was I created a mental health emergency plan and I opted in peer support protectors or what I call personal protectors into my plan. And that's about five or six people that all have my doctor's information and they have release forms signed to usurp HIPAA privacy laws. And that means that when they call my doctor and say, how's Kevin in treatment? They get the truthful answer and the whole answer so that they can best serve me and help keep me safe. There are things people do. Uh, there's some great resources that we have for folks, and I'd love to share them with your audience if that's okay. Sure. So a couple things. I mentioned it earlier. The YouTube.com slash Kevin Hines has 500 plus videos, all designed to help your brain, mind, behavior, mental, and physical health and well-being. They are uh, dedicated to help helping people stay here. Uh, people from all around the world write to say that these videos save their lives. We don't own that. We just we just put the message out there. We're conduits, and the and the videos do the do the work they do. Um, we have a, a, a website called kevinhindsstory.com slash resources, and this has the ten step guide to better brain health, and you can train with that PowerPoint. And then there's a, a teens guide, to, a parents guide to teen suicide prevention. And then there's a, a guide to the YouTube channel on what videos help what person with what, what mental struggle. So there's three resources there. Uh, and, and then there's a, a, my new book, uh, The Third Rail, In My Mania I Became. Uh, and you can find that at thethirdrailbook.com. And that's the, and then the number three, R-D, spelled out. Uh, and then that book is a, the story of a man named Jesse Cohen. And it's written by Jesse Cohen and myself. Uh, and Jesse Cohen was a Tulane law student in his 20s in the height of the organized crime era in the 1990s uh, in, in New Orleans. And he, in his mania, became a vigilante. He was like, if you will, like Batman. He would go out in a black suit, black tie, and black shirt, and he would stop crimes listening to police scanners. And he, would, he was taught Krav Maga by a Vietnam War veteran. And he went out and he took criminals to task and then left them for the police. Um, and, and he, in his mania, it just led him to do this, to be this 
wielder of justice, but the story is absolutely phenomenal. It's a roller coaster of a ride. It's a pretty intense book, but the message is clear. Stay alive from suicidal ideation and, and, and keep fighting the pain. Jesse tragically lost his life to depression and suicide, um, but he left this legacy with this book, um, and it, it's, it's already helped people uh, stay alive. We've gotten messages from folks saying that this book saved their life. Um, and that was the purpose of writing the book. And it's written in Jesse's first person. Uh, and it is, it is powerful. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a message that is quite clear. So uh, those are our resources. We want them to help people stay here. We want them to help people fight their pain. And we want them to help people recognize their true value. And that suicide is never the answer. Well, Kevin, it sounds like you've done a tremendous amount of work, um, not only for yourself, but for others, and to give people the techniques in order to um, walk themselves through this journey. Um, I can tell you personally that I, I really identify with uh, working out and eating right and keeping yourself healthy, and, um, and I advocate for that because I think, I think that, that makes you feel uh, good. Um, so I, I, I get where, where you're coming from there. Um, let, let's talk about when you were, um, 17 and, and first diagnosed and tell me about the resources you had at home and in school and, and, and were they adequate at the time? You know, being first diagnosed with bipolar disorder, uh, there weren't many resources, certainly not at school. There was a, a good counselor that I had at school, Mr. Marty Picaccio and Mr. Uh, um, Vittorio Anastasio, they were, they were great. They were really helpful and, and kind to me. Um, but there weren't like, you know, um, places I could learn about my struggle. Uh, one of the things that happened later on is that I went to a family to family class at N NAMI National Alliance of Mental Illness with my father and we learned about depression together. And that was helpful. My psychiatrist was, was helpful but he turned out to be on methamphetamines the entire time he treated me as other patients. He needed help and he wasn't getting it. And he would end up taking his life uh, years later. We wouldn't learn about his struggles until five years after we started seeing him. I started seeing him. Uh, but my parents certainly didn't have the resources that are out there today. And there are plentiful resources out there today. Every time you turn around, there's a new mental health advocate popping up on Instagram or, 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 uh, or, or one of the social medias. Um, but really, you need, to, you need to do your research and carefully find out who are the leading authorities in, in mental health and well-being so that you get the best information possible and the best tools to fight your pain and to help your children or help your loved ones who are struggling. So... Um I have a personal question, I, and, and this is just something that I've, I've been dealing with for a while. I have a very good friend. He's obviously going through some psychosis. I've talked to him over and over again, tried to get him help, tried to offer to set up help for him. Um, and he's in a place now where he's like, no, I'm fine. you know. But when you listen to him, what he's saying does not make sense to, you know, um, He's not talking like in reality. So how do you get through to a person like that who says he's obviously going through something, but completely denies that there's something going on? So for folks in denial, it's a tricky situation. But one of the things that seems to work is this thing called the caring letters. You would be sent regular caring letters that said, hey, thinking about you, wishing you well, how are you feeling in treatment? Is there anything you need from us? How can we help you? Um, and these caring letters turned into uh, caring letters and caring packages. Uh, and the caring packages would be a whole bunch of things that the person loves in a package, plus four or five different letters from four or five different people that love and care for this person, all of them c including five things. A sentence about compassion, love for the person, lack of judgment, total empathy, and all the signs, symptoms, and triggers and issues you were worried about with that person. And so all of those letters included those five things. And what it did was, instead of going in one ear and out the other for the person, it ends up showing them 
rather than telling them they need help. So showing someone you need help rather than telling them can be often very much more effective than, than just speaking it. Um, and so th this seems to be a very helpful tool for people in denial uh, and for those who love them. Let's talk about schools today. Um, are we doing a, a good enough job at destigmatizing mental health and providing the resources that people need? You know, some, some high schools and colleges are doing a great job doing that, and some are not. Uh, I would say that there is a, there's a group of uh, high school and college leaders that seem to think that, um, you know, uh, if, if you talk about it, then it will get worse, which is not the case. If you talk about it, you will deduce who's in trouble and you will get them to safety. And some folks just don't comprehend that. Some people in leadership of schools don't comprehend that. But there are some schools around the country and around the world that are really taking a, a, a first step uh, and have been taking the first steps into acclimating their, their, their student population into the mental health foyer, you know, basically saying we, we are going to cover this topic, we are going to talk about it all year round, and we are going to help benefit your mental health on a regular basis by doing these activities. And they're, they're really making some great headway in keeping kids safe. Uh, there are some great programs out there that are doing those things. Um, and, and, and there are some great advocates out there doing those things. Um, my wife and I are, are, are some of them. We, we, we go out, we go to high schools and colleges all around the world, and we share stories of lived experience, not just for myself, but from some of our Conquer Collective. And we help people who are in pain recognize their true value and get them to a safe place. Can you t tell me a little bit about the work that you and your wife are doing um, with the Kevin and Margaret Hines Foundation? Certainly. Uh, well, what we're doing is uh, we're raising funds to uh, give scholarships to students and kids who want to be in the suicide prevention field. So we're getting them into conferences and events and, 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 and things of that nature so they can learn and educate themselves about how uh, to be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. We're also uh, raising funds uh, to give to kids who otherwise couldn't afford uh, teletherapy so that they have free teletherapy uh, so that they can get that and, 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 and be given uh, treatment and time and, and help for their mental well-being. So if someone doesn't have that, that readily available access to mental health counseling, that's the direction that you're going to send them in, that, that there, there are telemedicine, there are ways to get to, to connect to someone to talk about your mental health. Yeah, so you don't feel so alone and so siloed. So you feel like you have someone to fall back on. And, and so you can tell your pain and your struggle to, to someone who genuinely cares about your well-being and your, your future. So what's the one piece of advice um, that you would tell a person right now who was thinking about taking his or her own life? You know what I would say to you is that you need to be more kind to yourself, compassionate and forgiving of yourself. Um, suicide is not the answer to your problem. It is the problem. You are a gift to this world. You are meant to be here until your natural end. Uh, and you can fight this pain and you can survive it. Pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. It's a choice. If you recognize that if you call yourself a sufferer, you're becoming the victim of your own story. But if you say you're living with fighting and battling and thriving despite of your diagnosis or struggle, you then become the hero of your own story. Fight to become that hero. Recognize your true value and that suicide doesn't have to be your answer. Uh, it is a problem. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, again, if this was triggering for anyone, I want to again give the National Suicide Hotline 1-800-273-8255. And Kevin, you have a, you have a text uh, where people can text? Yes, text CNQR to 741741, the crisis text line. Courage to talk about your mental health. Normalize the conversation. Ask those questions. Are you thinking of killing yourself? Have you made plans to take your life? Do you have the means? And R for recovery because I'm living proof. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us today. It, it was a pleasure um, 
I for certain learned a tremendous amount through your story and your life. Um, uh, I admire, you know, what you've made of your life, and 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 you should know that there are people out there that love you, and I think everyone out there who has issues of mental health should know that there are people, even if you don't know the people, there are people that love you, and love is out there. Thank you very much, Jay. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Be well. You too. All Inclusive is a production of the Ruderman Family Foundation. Our key mission is the full inclusion of people with disabilities in all aspects of society. You can find All Inclusive on Apple Podcast, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. To view the show notes, transcripts, or to learn more, go to rudermanfoundation.org slash all-inclusive. Have an idea for a podcast? Be sure to tweet at Jay Ruderman.